Please turn once again to your Bibles to the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. Moses writes here as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let us pray. Father, as we approach your word again this morning, we first express our thanksgiving to you for giving us a record of how things came to be as they are in this world, how the creation happened, and then how the fall happened, and how all that works together and what it means for us. We thank you that you give us an account of not only simply the creation of the universe and of things, uh, but here in this passage before us, you give us an account of the creation of Eve. And not simply a, a, an account of her creation, but also instruction based on that. Father, this morning as we live here in 21st century America, and there are uh, questions about things like... Uh, what is marriage? Who's it for? What, what's it about? That we can turn back to your light, to your revelation, and find out answers to these things. We know as, as uh, we still walk in this world, we, we still uh, battle the flesh. And even as Christians, there's still sin in our lives. And we don't always live up to these ideals that you've given here. But we thank you that because of your son Jesus, that he has paid for all of our sins through his death on the cross and rose again from the dead. Lord, if there be anyone here this morning who's never received your son Jesus as they hear the gospel this morning, please help them to receive it and receive eternal life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is... <clears throat> Today is the ninth message in our series, God's Wisdom Amid a Brave New World. And we especially in this series are focusing on areas of identity, marriage, family, work, all these different areas. There are several reasons we're taking an extended look at these particular areas of God's wisdom, but one is so we can be confident that the things that we believe in each of these areas that we can be confident that it's not simply a, a tradition. It's not simply, uh, uh, well, it's always been done that way before. Or maybe I'm thinking of things wrongly, but I want us to be confident that the things that we say we believe, we can say, yes, God's word says this. It's not just my opinion. It's not just my thought on these things. I can point to the Word of God and say, God says this, and therefore that's why I believe as I do. Let me illustrate uh, this morning why it's important to know that the things that we hold to be true about our identity and marriage and family and work, uh, why that's so significant, because... Uh, uh, an opinion I don't think will cut it in times like these. Here's, here's an example. On January 2nd, a 19-year-old Georgia police officer, Jacob Kersey, posted a 20-word message about his view of marriage on Facebook. This is his own personal Facebook account. And here, here's the message. 
God designed marriage. Marriage refers to Christ and the church. That's why there is no such thing as homosexual marriage. Uh, an article on this story said, the next day, Kersey said he received a phone call from his supervisor who told him that someone had complained about the post and to take it down. When Kersey refused, the supervisor warned him that failure to delete the Facebook post on marriage could result in his termination. After further meetings, the following day, the article reported that he said, I was being placed on administrative leave while the city investigated to see if I could keep my job. Remember, it's just this little 20-word Facebook post that he had on his own Facebook account. He was later allowed to keep his job, but due to the precarious nature and everything that preceded uh, this, his decision over the last few days, he decided just to resign. Uh, what's the point? The point is this. When simply a 20-word Facebook post saying, yeah, God designed marriage, marriage refers to Christ and the church, that's why there's no such thing as homosexual marriage, where that on someone's personal account can be something used to at least threaten you to be terminated from your job, we need to be sure that what we believe and teach about marriage and identity and family that is not just our opinion, that it's something that is grounded in God's revelation, that something is grounded and I can say, thus says the Lord, because as time goes on, there may be cost for saying things like that, that really, it's, it's, I don't think it's incredibly controversial what he said, uh, but there, there can be cost for saying such things. So we better be sure we know what God's word says about these things. And that's where we go back to Genesis. The passage we just read, and we'll be getting into again this morning, is central in the Bible and to the meaning of marriage. Uh, we know this last week, but I want to emphasize it again, that when Jesus was asked a question about marriage, marriage and divorce, uh, this is the passage that he went back to in his response to the Pharisees who are asking the question about this. This is the passage that Jesus went back to to settle the issue about, here's what marriage is, here's what it's about, here's the nature of marriage. This is where Jesus and the Apostle Paul both went to bring out the true nature of marriage. So today, again, we turn back to Genesis and we... Are, are trying to learn about marriage. What is it? What is it about? What does it point to? We're going back to Genesis to look to Eve's creation, Adam and Eve in paradise in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. But again, taking the lead from Jesus and the Apostle Paul, we realize this is more than simply an account of how Eve was created. It reveals truths at the heart of marriage and family as God intended it. So we'll focus on the creation of Eve, but more so, what can we learn from this account about marriage? We saw two principles last Sunday. This morning we'll see two more for a total of two and two is how much? Five. Good. Yes. Four. We're going to have a total of six principles, so that means there will be a part three, Lord willing. I hate to tell you that, that we'll only get two more done today, but okay. The first couple principles that we learned about marriage, number one, one of the main purposes of marriage is companionship. Look down in your Bible, so Genesis 2, verse 18. This is what we saw last Sunday. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So marriage is God's answer to this not good situation in creation, on the sixth day of creation. It's not good for man to be alone, and that leads God to create Eve, companionship. We saw in chapter 1 that one of the main purposes of marriage was to be fruitful and multiply. So that's one of the main purposes of marriage. Here in chapter 2, we see another of the main purposes of marriage is companionship. We'll see later in this study of Genesis chapter 2, this is what we get, we'll get to next week, 
but that a third purpose for marriage, these are the three purposes of marriage as I understand it, is it gives a living picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Lord willing, we'll see that next Sunday morning. But, but here, and last Sunday in Genesis, we see companionship is one of the main purposes of marriage. It's God's answer to the not good situation of man being alone initially in the garden. Second principle we saw last week, God created the wife to be a helper suitable to the husband. Look at verse 18 again, Genesis 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Uh, I will make him a helper fit for him. As another translation has it, suitable. Or the King James Version has it, meet. Basically, this is a translation of a Hebrew word that literally means like, opposite him. In other words, like, yet unlike, The helper that Adam needed and the helper that God would create was not going to be identical to him, but rather complementary. I take it that that this further reveals mutual companionship as the kind of help to be provided for here in the broadest sense. They would each balance each other's strengths and weaknesses. That's where we begin this morning. The actual creation of Eve and what we learn about marriage. Third, because of the nature of Eve's creation, by God's design, marriage is only to be between a man and a woman. Look down to Genesis 2.21 in your Bibles. Genesis 2.21 and verse 22 we'll look at. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. This is unique. In all creation that we've seen so far, uh, the creation of Eve, the creation of woman, nothing else has been like this. Look to Genesis 2 verse 7. We see detail about the creation of man or Adam Genesis 2, verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So God took uh, inanimate material, the dust of the ground, and he formed that, and he formed it into man, and he breathed into him the breath of life. That's the creation of Adam. Look, <coughs> look down to verse 19. Genesis two nineteen. Now, out of the ground the Lord had formed the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So man, every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, they were all similarly created out of the ground. But here we have the woman out of all living beings, out of all living creatures, and the males and females of all the rest of the creatures that were created, out of all these living creatures, only woman is created in this unique way. She is formed out of Adam. Specifically, out of one of his ribs. And uh, since Adam will say in a moment, uh, when he first sees Eve, when he first sees his wife, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So I I take it there's the bone that God formed Eve out of Adam, but also some flesh from connected with the bone or something like that. We don't get too far into these things. It's probably part of that as well. I love the language used here by Moses in this description. And when I say Moses, I, I believe Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, but Also, as we understand Scripture, I believe God the Holy Spirit so moved in Moses' life and heart. It's not just Moses' word. It's God's word that says these things. So when I say Moses, I like how he writes this. I I also intend to mean God through Moses said these things. Look at verse 22 again. Here's the wording that I'm saying I love. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the woman... 
he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The word translated as made here, this is the, the Hebrew word that I, I really like. It's from a Hebrew, made is from a Hebrew word here that literally meant built. From Adam's rib, God built the woman. Bible scholar Victor Hamilton notes, uh, the verb built by its very definition implies beauty, stability, and durability. Working with clay, God is potter. Working with body tissue, God is builder. Eve thus becomes the first thing that is created from another living thing. In the Kyle and Delich commentary uh, on the Old Testament, they, they bring out very well the connection between Eve's creation, and that's why we're spending a lot of time on this, the way that Eve was created, and then what we're going to see about marriage in a moment. And this principle that I said about marriage is for men and women, man and woman united together. Uh, they say this, Kyle and Delich, The woman was created not of dust of the earth, but from a rib of Adam, because she was formed for an inseparable unity and fellowship of life with the man. And the mode of her creation, the fact that she's created out of the rib of man, the mode of her creation was to lay the actual foundation for the moral ordinance of marriage. He wrote that in like 1862 or something like that. It was a ways back, so the language is a little old and it's a little stilted. But the point is, what he's saying is, the way that she was created, that lays the foundation for what follows the next verse here or so about what marriage is. Look down to verse 23. Here's Adam's reaction when he first sees Eve. Genesis 2 verse 23. Then the man said, this at last. Remember all these other creatures had been paraded before him and he had named all of them. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. And he, uh, this is a good word play in English. In Hebrew, it's isha, woman. Because she's taken out of man, ish. So in the Hebrew, there's kind of that word play on it too. That, that relationship between men and women just, just in the name. Now, uh, it sounds a little awkward to bring this out in a translation, but in the original Hebrew, there's three times in this one verse that Adam keeps saying, this one, he, he's looking at Eve, this one, this one, this one. Like he's really excited about what he's seeing here. Uh, the Legacy Standard Bible brings out in its translation, again, it's, it's a little stilted, but it translates it like this. Then the man said, this one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman because this one was taken out of man. It's like Adam is looking at Eve and he's saying, perfect, this is great. I'm so happy, you know, God, you are great. And this is why God, after the sixth day of creation, can look at all that he had made and say, it is very good. Now, I want you to notice something. Verse 24. So verse 23, that is Adam's word as he first sees Eve. Verse 24 is not Adam talking anymore. It's Moses writing. and It's God through Moses talking in verse 24. Verse 24 is what Jesus quotes and what Paul quotes when they're talking about the nature of marriage and how God designed things from the beginning. Look at verse 24, Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 24 is the statement of what the nature of marriage is and what comes along with it. This is God speaking through Moses in verse 24. What I want you to see here and why I'm stressing verse 24 and uh, as we're looking at the creation of Eve here, 
Starts with the word, therefore. Verse 24 is based on Eve's unique creation from out of Adam. Start of verse 24. Therefore, or because of this, what has just been seen in verse 23, or on account of this, what we just saw in verse 23, on account of this very special and unique creation of woman out of man, therefore what's said in verse 24 about marriage is what it is. Michael Brown summarizes this and brings out this third principle that we see here about marriage. He says, only a man and woman can be joined, rejoined together in this way. A man plus a man or a woman plus a woman cannot possibly share the same union as a man and a woman since they do not share the essential of fundamental sameness and difference. They cannot form a complementary couple the way God intended. Remember from last week, and I remind you already this morning, uh, that Hebrew word connected with helper from verses 18 and 20. A helper fit for him. A helper, uh, another translation, suitable for him. A helper meet for him, uh, uh, for Adam. Literally, like opposite. Eve was complementary to Adam, not the same. And although one of the purposes for marriage that we've seen is being fruitful and multiplying, that's Genesis chapter 1, we saw that. That's that's not even the issue here when we get to the very heart of marriage in verse 24. Verse 24, marriage is based on, is because of, it's on account of the fact that woman was taken out of man. It's kind of a silly statement, and it doesn't capture all the biblical truth, but you'll probably remember this statement, and you've heard it before more than anything I've already said. But God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Now, that's, that's what we, we see here. I mean, it's kind of silly, but I, I think you'll probably remember that. But that's why, by God's design, homosexual marriage, it, it's, it's not that. So the third principle Because of the nature of Eve's creation, she was made very uniquely. It was very special. Taken out of Adam, made from his rib. Because of the nature of Eve's creation, by God's design, marriage is only to be between a man and a woman. Verse 24 has the remainder of our principles. Uh, Verse 24, very significant Bible verse. And I deliberated on, uh, should we do all of them this morning? Should we do some of them this morning and talk more next week? Well, the answer that you know, because I've already told you, we'll be back again next week. So there's a chance, don't get excited, there's a chance we might end a little early this morning because we're not going over all the principles. Yeah, don't cheer. (laughs) But uh, we'll, we'll see. Well, just one more principle that we're looking at today. Remember, both Jesus and Paul go back to Genesis 2, verse 24 to speak about what marriage is. So why I'm bringing this out is, and maybe you don't even think about these things, but as you read different Bible scholars, you start seeing what they're saying and you want to cover your bases. So uh, this is not only a statement about Adam and Eve. It's a statement about marriage as God intended it. In context here, we see it, since it even gives instruction about leaving father and mother, who is Adam and Eve's father and mother? Well, uh, just in the context here, just by the fact that the next statement says, well, for this reason, you're to leave your father and mother, we know it's not just applicable to Adam and Eve. They didn't have an earthly, a human father and mother. So, that's, that's one thing just in context. We see it's, it's broader, it's a paradigm here, it's uh, setting forth just the nature of marriage. This is how God designed it. And although after sin entered the world and almost immediately caused problems with this ideal, we'll, if we kept going in Genesis, first big thing you see happen after Adam and Eve's sin is murder in a family. 
Next kind of big thing you see after that, a, a chapter later, is polygamy. So very quickly, things departed far from this ideal. But this is the ideal. At least we want to know what the ideal is, a marriage as God intended it. And that's what Jesus went back to as he discussed marriage. And that's what we want to at least know what the ideal is. So the fourth principle. The husband-wife relationship takes precedence over any other human relationship. Look down to verse 24 again. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Note first off who this instruction is focused on. The man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. That should grab your attention that the focus is on the man here. Because as we go through the rest of Genesis, we see that uh, sometimes, uh, I guess I can't think of all the times in Genesis where we see marriage, but at least sometimes, I think we could even say most of the time, when there was a marriage, it was the woman who left her family and came to be with the man. But the focus here is on the man for this reason, the man shall leave his father and his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. I take it we're seeing here that the man is specifically focused on here because although both man and woman, men and women, they're, they're both created in God's image, we saw that as our identity, therefore they're both equals before God. We see also just with this direction, I take it to the man here, that the man is to be the leader in the relationship. So he specifically is focused on. I take it the idea is that if the relationship is going to be all that God intended it to be, that that responsibility rests ultimately upon the shoulders of the man, on the husband. One other thing we see from the passage expressing the man's leadership in marriage this is kind of subtle, but if, if you read different Bible scholars, this is pretty uh, standard uh, consideration. The fact that Adam named his wife after her creation here. Here in Genesis 2 especially, as well in ancient society, to name someone or something would indicate a, a level <coughs> of <coughs> sovereignty. Adam had named all the creatures so far that were brought before him. Here, as God brings Eve before, and she wasn't even named Eve yet at this point. Here, as God brings the woman, the helper fit for him before him, he names her. He says, she shall be called woman. So he's named all these other uh, animals, creatures, living beings that are out there. He sees Eve, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He's later going to name her specifically Eve. So I, I take it just in some, some hints, some things that are happening here in the passage, even in Genesis chapter 2, we see the, the nature of the husband's leadership in this one flesh relationship is brought out. But this principle is, and maybe you're saying, well, Scott, where do you get the idea that the husband-wife relationship takes precedence over any other human relationship? Two reasons. First, from the start of verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother. This Hebrew term for leave here, it doesn't always convey the sense of physically leaving. And we see often in Genesis that there, there'd be households with, say, for instance, Abraham would be the patriarch, and then you'd have uh, his son Isaac within that household and, and kind of his family relationship. So it, it wasn't always necessarily physically leaving, but this Hebrew term leave here is sometimes translated as forsake. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 20. The Lord will send, you, send on you curses, confusion, and frustration on all that you undertake to do. This is not good. This is not talking about marriage. Until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds. Here's why we're here. Because you have forsaken me. Uh, forsaken there is the same Hebrew root word as translated here in Genesis 2.24 as leave. 
for husbands leaving father and mother, of course, this isn't in an absolute sense. Uh, they're still called to honor father and mother, to, to help father and mother whenever that might be needed. But what it does indicate is there's now a new primary relationship that's been established, the husband-wife relationship. That's the leaving of the father and mother. Uh, Craig Blomberg puts it well. He says, uh, the idea of that is to transfer one's fundamental allegiance from parents to spouse. In the biblical world, this did not often refer to setting up a separate domicile. Extended families regularly live together. But there's that fundamental transfer of allegiance. Now it's not just about my father, mother, and my wife. That's number one. That's the primary relationship from here on out. How many marriages today, and again, we talked about this, the ideal, and we know the ideal is uh, not always found in this world today, but, but just with this principle of now there is a new fundamental allegiance <clears throat> once the marriage happens, that's between husband and wife, that's the fundamental allegiance, leave the father and the mother. How many marriages today are not what they could be because this fundamental allegiance has never changed. There's still maybe more of allegiance to the father and the mother than there is to the wife, or vice versa. Uh, bottom line, what it's saying with marriage, that parents, and always were to honor them until, until, the day, until the day we die, we're called to honor our father and our mother. But we see with this, that with marriage, parents are no longer the most important relationship on this earth once there's marriage. The wife is. And it's the husband here who's instructed to make that happen. So that's one reason why I, our, our principle is uh, this, this relationship takes precedence over any other human relationship. I'd say another thing that we see here, a second reason for this principle in verse 24, is we're told at the end of verse 24, read verse 24 again, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Your relationship to your parents is not this. Your relationship with your children is not this. Only your relationship with your husband or wife is a one flesh relationship. In God's arithmetic of marriage, one plus one, one. So there you can give a wrong, in a sense, a wrong answer. Instead of five, who said five earlier when I said two plus two? <laughs> so one plus one equals one in marriage. So what, what's this mean? It at least involves the sexual relationship that's to happen only within this covenant relationship of marriage. And I'd say, really, that's, that's the heart of it. Uh, the, the, the oneness between husband and wife flows out of that. But really, at the heart of it, it's the sexual union that happens within the context of marriage. Uh, why do I say that? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16, again, this is not, he, this, this is not uh, he's rebuking the Corinthians here, but the principle you'll see, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16, or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So Paul's rebuking them here. Obvious, obviously, as Paul's speaking out of a prostitute, this isn't happening within the confines of marriage. But he's bringing out the implication that when you have sexual relations with someone, you're becoming one flesh with them. And he uses what we see here in uh, Genesis 2, verse 24, to back up that statement. It's not simply a physical thing with sexual relations. There's, there's a uniting in sexual relations that should never happen outside of marriage. That's where God designs it to happen. That's where it's to be about. And that's that one flesh relationship. Here's how Jesus puts things in Matthew chapter 19 as he's answering a question about divorce. 
He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Start of verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. In marriage, it's not something you're, you're shooting for, you're hoping for. Uh, maybe it'll happen in some marriages. In marriage, when the marriage has been consummated, they are no longer two, but one flesh. It happens. You have that one flesh relationship. In coming together in marriage with that sex relationship, the two become one flesh. In a sense, again, man and woman are rejoined back together since Eve was taken out of man and out of Adam's rib. Uh, Leon Morris notes this about the two becoming one flesh. He says, this refers to the sexual act which unites husband and wife in the most intimate fashion. Paul can object to consorting with harlots because it involves becoming one flesh, a relationship that befits a husband and his wife only. So then, the married couple are no longer what they were, two isolated and separate individuals. They are now bound in the closest and most intimate of human relationships and are, in fact, one flesh. I take it this is why the Apostle Paul makes the application that he does to the husband in Ephesians chapter 5. Husband and wife, you now have this unique relationship. You have this one flesh relationship. It's unlike anything else in the whole world. Uh, please turn over in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be back in Ephesians uh, as we get further along in our steer series and look at this in more detail, but just kind of briefly this morning, this is an application of the fact that the husband and wife are one flesh. Ephesians 5, verse 28. This is page 979 in the Pew Bible. Ephesians 5, verse 28. In the same way, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Because you're one flesh. When you love your wife, when you seek for her best, you're just loving yourself. You're in this one flesh relationship, so when you're loving her, you're loving yourself. Verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh. Now, Paul even picks up instead of moving from body in verse 28. Now he's talking about flesh here. I take it, he's, and he's going to quote from Genesis 2, verse 24 in a moment. We won't go that far. So I take it, this verse is on his mind here. Genesis 2, 24. Uh, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. You are one flesh with your wife. Remember that first. And then second, with that in mind, no one ever hated his own body. No one ever hated his own flesh, right? You don't say, yeah, uh, I'm getting sick, so I hate myself, so I, I don't want to take any medicine. I want, to be, I want to feel the worst that I can feel, and I'm hungry, so I want to be more hungry. I want to feel awful. We, we don't think like that. If we're hungry, we feed ourselves. If we're getting sick, we take medicine. We, we, we take care of ourselves. We nourish and cherish ourselves. Well, your wife, she's one flesh with you. Just as you would never treat your body, literal body, that way. So husbands, she's one flesh. You, no one would hate his own flesh. You nourish and cherish it. So love your wife. Treat her that way. Cherish her as you do your own body. But bottom line here this morning, you are one flesh in the marriage relationship. Do your actions reflect that? Do your attitudes reflect that? Both husbands and wives, 
You know, same thing holds true for the wife toward the husband. You're in that one flesh relationship. Do your attitudes reflect that? Do your actions reflect that you are in a one flesh relationship? Or is there that constant disunity and strain just to do my own thing? I don't really care what my mate does or what they think without considering uh, the fact I, I'm in this one flesh relationship. And in light of the principle that we talked about, does that one flesh relationship, your marriage relationship, does that truly take precedence over any other earthly relationship? Or does, it, does your relationship with your parents or your children or your friends or your coworkers, who, who knows what, there's all kinds of other possibilities that could be out there. Is that what takes precedence or is it the one flesh relationship, the, the husband and the wife? By God's grace, as you reflect on this, this morning, if you look in your life and in your marriage and you say, yeah, maybe uh, other things or other people do take precedence over my mate. Well, seek to change that to match your current marriage with the ideal. We find here as God originally designed marriage. When we get to our last principle of marriage from Genesis, Lord willing, next Sunday, We'll come back to this context. We'll look down to verse uh, 31 and 32. That's what we'll see that really all, uh, a thing that marriage is pointing to, is designed to point to, is Christ and the church and that relationship. We'll look at that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But as we close our time this morning, look up to verse 25 here in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Again, we'll get to Ephesians 5, and we'll talk more about the husband's role and the husband's command and how he used to love. But what I want, what, what I want you to focus on here is Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for her by dying for her, dying for the church. And we're the church. Why did Christ die? Why did he have to die for the sake of others? The Bible brings out that uh, in Genesis chapter 3, sin came into the world. And since that point, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and has disrupted marriage and family and identity and all these kind of things. It's made a mess of all that sin has. But the most significant thing is with sin comes death. Death being uh, a separation. A separation from God. If nothing changes from that separation here and now in this world that uh, the wages of sin is death. So if all have sinned, the wages of sin is death. All are separated from this holy God. If nothing changes here in your time in this world before you die physically, then you're separated from God forever in hell. Very bad news. Very bad news. But I ask the question, well, why did Christ give himself up? Why did he die? He died for us. He died to rescue us. He died to save us from spiritual death, separation from God, hell, God's wrath. When Christ was on the cross, he was not there for any wrongs that he had done. He was dying on the cross for our sins. He was standing in our place the wrath that we should have experienced, it would have been just that we did experience. God in his grace and God in his love sent forth his son Jesus to die for us. That's the gospel. Christ died for our sins. And on the third day he rose again from the dead. That's, that's the news. And then there's a response to that news. And you need to respond to that news to be saved, to be forgiven, to be born again, to have eternal life. 
In response to the news that Christ died for your sins and rose again from the dead is through is to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To repent is to turn away from your old self-rule and going your own way and sin and rebellion, to turn away from that to acknowledge, okay, Jesus, you're king, you're Lord, I want to follow you. To believe is to uh, believe in who Jesus is. So it's believing facts about him, that he's fully God and fully man, that he's the Christ. But also, and especially to believe, is to believe in what he did, to rely on what he did to save you, that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. Uh, to believe in him savingly is to rely on that, to say, Christ died for me. This is my hope. I, I rest on that. I rely on that. This is my only hope of coming into a relationship with you, Father, what Christ did for me on the cross. So if you've never done so this morning, God calls out to you to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your instruction, and most of all, we thank you, Father, for your love. We see your good design in marriage. We see your good design in creation. We see your graciousness and kindness. And you, you had it all there, and it was all laid out perfectly. And then there's rebellion against you and what you said. And it's not just Adam and Eve. It's each one of us. Father, we thank you that because of your son Jesus, that we have forgiveness of our sins. All the times we've not lived up to the ideal of what marriage is, all the times we've not been the kind of people that you call us to be, uh, because of what Jesus has done for us, there is forgiveness. And we thank you for that. We ask, Father, though, as your people who want to live for you and live your way, that you'll help us to uh, live according to the design of marriage that you lay out in Genesis 2, verse 24, and the principles we find in Genesis 2. Help us through your Holy Spirit to live out these things. We, we know your design is best. We want what's best. And we want to live that way in this world, so help us to do so. And Father, you know the hearts and minds of everyone here this morning. If there's someone here or listening who still stands under your wrath, who if you were to return today uh, to take us to be with yourself in the rapture, they, they would not be going to be with you. They'd be left behind here on this earth. Or if there's someone who, we hate to even think it, but would pass away today uh, that would not be going to be with you in heaven, if there's anyone here listening or anyone here uh, in this room who's in that state, in that spot, please make that very real to them, as well as the realness and the truthfulness and the glory of your gospel, that because of your love and because of your grace, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Help anyone here who's never done this, who's not yet saved, not yet forgiven, by your grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.